This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. I have with me a 40 year veteran of meteorology, John Morales. John, welcome to Star Talk. Oh, it's, it's incredible to be here. So honored. Now, I check in your bio. You are based in Miami, Florida, which means as a meteorologist, hurricanes might preoccupy your time and attention, especially in the fall, just, just by a little bit. And we are recording this one day before Hurricane Milton makes landfall on the west coast of Florida. And so before we discuss more about what may be different about that hurricane, uh, let's just lay some foundations here. The meteorological community, at last I checked, names all storms, all low pressure systems that build in the Atlantic, and only some of them become hurricanes. That is correct. Uh, they've been using names uh, alphabetically uh, since the 1950s. Um, and first it was all female names. And uh, rightfully so, in the 1970s, that was changed after some protests uh, because women felt that why would only women names be associated with devastation? Uh, so uh, now they alternate male and female names in four different languages, uh, Neil. Uh, the, the, uh, they, they use English, of course, but also you have to remember all the languages spoken across the Atlantic Basin. So Spanish is also utilized, Dutch for some of the Dutch Antilles, and French, of course, because French is spoken in some of those uh, Caribbean islands too. Uh, what makes the fall so susceptible to hurricanes when we don't typically think about them in the winter, spring, and summer? Yeah, what's going on is that, you know, throughout the summer in the Northern Hemisphere, you have, of course, the Northern Hemisphere absorbing quite a bit of solar radiation throughout the process of, of, of the summer. And you don't see the peak of uh, ocean heat content happening until later, much later than, than uh, uh, you know, the summer solstice, which would be, what, June 21st or so? So if the oceans are warmest, not at the summer solstice, but later into the end of summer and beginning of autumn in the Northern Hemisphere now, uh, that is when you'll see that peak of hurricane activity because tropical storms uh, feed off of warm waters. You know, the air starts to rise because it's buoyant, much like a hot air balloon would rise when you, when you use that flame, right? So as that air is rising, the pressure at the surface starts to diminish. The, the weight of the column of air that is above you starts to diminish. And then all the air that's around that region wants to rush in to fill that relative vacuum. As that happens, what's the air, what are these air molecules going to do as they rush towards the center? They start to also rise. They congregate, they clash, the air molecules rise. There's and no place else for them to go. No that's, place that's else for them on. to go because they can't go into the ocean, not dense enough for that to happen. So, so you've got further rise of air into the upper atmosphere. Now, let's get to the moisture part because that's really important. This is really humid air, okay? All this moisture is being evaporated off the surface of, of the ocean. And as that happens uh, and the air rises, in our lower atmosphere, known as the troposphere, there generally you will find that the temperatures are decreasing as you rise up into the troposphere. Well, the moisture that is in the air, which is in the form of water vapor now, as it ascends, the temperature drops and the temperature and the dew point temperature start to get closer to each other. Dew point is a direct measure of how much water vapor is in the air, okay? And the more water vapor you have, the higher that dew point temperature is. When the air temperature and the dew point temperature match, you have reached full saturation. And the, this condensation process releases energy. And you and I can explain this together if you want, but if, if to boil water, you need to add heat for that to happen. Well, what's the opposite of boiling water? Condensing water. So where's that energy going? The energy is released. That's why it's latent as it goes up. Energy is released 
And that it, it simply adds to the entire process of the buoyancy, the entire process of the winds accelerating at the surface because you get more of this vertical motion happening. Uh, so the pressure continues to drop at the surface. The air continues to try to rush into the center. The winds and the process are accelerating and that's how you get uh, the tropical depressions to become tropical storms to eventually become hurricanes. So now when the storm gets strong enough, what's the threshold for hurricane classification? The wind speed? Is it a wind speed or an air pressure measure? It, it, no, it's it's wind speed. You reach a uh, hurricane classification when you reach wind speeds of 74 miles per hour. And then within the hurricane uh, bracket, which is quite wide, it is subdivided in the Saffir Simpson scale. It's which is purely these days a wind scale and not a storm surge scale. I was looking at the wiki page on the Saffir Simpson scale, and I was reading from category one to category five in sequence, and it was like Dante's descent into hell. First one, uh, some tiles will blow off your roof. That's it. Some trees will bend a little, some flooding. Okay. Then in number two, all roofs are gone. <laughs> all leaves are stripped off of trees that keep going up. Bark gets stripped off of trees. And category five, there's no trees left. And I said, oh my gosh. Right. If anyone had to describe a descent into hell, it's the Saffir Simpson scale going from one to five. That's right. And, and, and that's why sometimes, especially in, in, in this era that we're living in, you see these hurricanes like Otis in 2023 off the coast of uh, Acapulco, Mexico, go from a tropical storm to a category five in the span of less than 24 hours. The um, force on any surface from uh, moving air, from wind, moving air, the force on any surface is, a, it, it's a quadratic uh, a proportion or equation. So if you if you double the wind speed, it's four times the fourths. If you triple the wind speed, it's nine times the force, right? Three squared is nine. Uh, so uh, a 150 mile per hour hurricane has nine times destruction potential from wind alone than a 50 mile per hour tropical storm. Just this morning, I rewatched Carl Sagan's testimony in Congress in 1985, warning lawmakers about the dangers of continuing to stoke this greenhouse effect from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, as air temperature rises, it seems to me it could hold more moisture if we have a warmer earth. So why does that automatically mean, because we've been told that it would give you either more storms or more severe storms. When you can add 7% more moisture for every one degree Celsius that you increase the temperature of the atmosphere, right? So, so I mean, 7% is a non-trivial amount, okay? Because, you know, when you're, when you're talking about what just happened in the Western North Carolina mountains with Hurricane Helene, you know, do you think that 7% makes a difference? Of course it did. So when it rains, it rains harder in a, in a warmer world now. When it rains, it rains harder. And because the oceans, so the, the oceans all over the world are pretty much at record hot levels. There are some exceptions, you know, off the coast of Greenland, for example, and we can talk about why. But, but uh, mostly, especially the tropical belt, you'll find that the oceans are generally warmer. There are, by the way, some short-term natural climatic variations like El Nino and La Nina, which can change uh, the uh, surface near uh, temperature in, in the equatorial Pacific, for example, just, just to give you some of those short-term natural variations. But the trend overall uh, is since uh, 100 years ago has been for warming of the oceans. And I bring this up because, uh, again, the main factor that drives the intensity of tropical cyclones all around the planet, not just in the Atlantic, is the sea surface temperatures and the amount of ocean heat content that you have. Speed limits for hurricanes have changed. And I'm not talking about how fast it moves across the ocean. I'm talking about how fast the wind speeds can get. I noticed from the hurricane maps that Hurricane Milton was birthed in the Gulf of Mexico. And I hadn't typically, you know, my stereotype of a hurricane is one that forms, you know, halfway across the Atlantic and migrates towards the Caribbean and either goes up the coast or crosses over. So, 
So how often do you get a hurricane forming in the Gulf of Mexico? You mentioned Milton, and there are there are some unique aspects, or at least unique in the last uh, 150 plus years. With oh, okay. Yeah. So unique in modern civilization. Yes. Okay. Correct. Uh, always important to, to state that caveat, but uh, you have to go back to the mid 19th century to find a hurricane that formed in the far western Gulf of Mexico and traversed west to east nearly. Uh, I know at the end, Milton is, you know, has made a, a turn to the northeast, but, uh, you know, traversing west to east, that is highly unusual, highly unusual. And, and, and the reason it's memorable from the 19th century is because these systems that hit the Florida coast in perpendicular fashion. In other words, the west coast of Florida kind of sort of oriented north-south, the hurricane kind of sort of going straight west to east. Uh, well, it hits the coast perpendicular and it causes a greater storm surge. Storm surge is dependent on many factors, including the angle of approach of the hurricane to the coast. Uh, so is it, is it the new normal that we would be getting hurricanes that are rare, possibly unique in their formation and in their devastation? Listen, we're already seeing that. Some of some of the uh, storms that were concurrent with um, Milton, Leslie and Kirk, each one of them set records for being the strongest hurricanes ever recorded so far east in the Atlantic, so late in the season. Mm. That, that's a mouthful. But yes, okay. yes, uh, yes. Right. So, so, you know, an October hurricane way out there in the Atlantic, closer to Africa than the United States. Okay. Becoming a hurricane that had not been seen again, in modern records, which date back to 1851. But by the way, by pressure, Milton is now the fifth strongest hurricane ever recorded in the Atlantic Basin. So John, you're a meteorologist and you report this on television and people want advice from you. They see a hurricane is coming, our models are good, we know when it's gonna landfall, what do you tell people to do? Well, in a nutshell, you run from the water and you hide from the wind. Um, so, you know, you, you must run from the water, why? Because if you're going to get a storm surge that is 8, 10, 12, 15, 20 feet high, uh, that becomes unsurvivable. You, you just, you can't swim in that. Or if you're trapped in your house, you get trapped in the attic and you drown. Uh, so, so you run from the water. Uh, so thank you for sharing uh, some of your time with us. Uh, it just Can you give a shout out to the station who you report with? Of course. Uh, uh, so I'm the hurricane specialist, former chief meteorologist, now hurricane specialist for NBC6. Uh, it's in the Miami Fort Lauderdale market, also serving the Florida Keys too. Uh, so that's the local affiliate, and your call letters are what there? WTVJ. Uh, there you go. <laughs> oldest station in the state of Florida. So we look forward to not only tapping your expertise, but the the strong dose of humanity you bring to your reporting, which we all value. So thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, this has been a Star Talk Explainer, trying to understand the current hurricane season and going into a future of what may be the, unfortunately, may be the new normal facing us all. Until next time, keep looking up.